Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of The Art Tenders with Mac and Dan. I am Dan, he is Mac. Hi! And there are some things that we gotta get out on the front end before we talk about Queen's Gambit, a miniseries that premiered and is on Netflix that is an adaption of a novel by the same name starring Anya Taylor-Joy. But like I said, we gotta get out some things on the front end. On my end, you know, if you hear some, you know, perhaps a child in the background that may or may not be my nephew. I just, you know, it probably, it's not going to happen, but I just want to get it out there in case it does happen. So you know who that is, who the culprit is. But aside from that, there's also another thing that we have to get to with Mac. He was wishing me to tell me a story. Is that true, Mac? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So if if you hear a a child in Danny's background, it is his nephew. If you hear a child in my background, it's because I'm at a school right now. Um, So uh, one one thing that I, that I looked up today, I had to look up today is um, what, what are technically the rules to me having a podcast while being a teacher? What does it say in my contract? And the rules are, I can say whatever I want outside of school, as long as I don't say the name of the school or the district that I teach for. And as long as I don't promote the podcast at school, which I have not done, right? I have not done. Very good. But, um, I made a bet with the kid the other day and (laughs) he was on my phone because everyone in class was playing among us except for him and so i felt kind of bad and i was like okay let's make a bet and i lost the bet so i gave by the way for for those of you who don't know among us is a very popular game with younger kids oh sorry yeah where they control these little avatars and like a few of those avatars are like traitors and they these traitors try to eliminate other characters in this game it's very very popular and i feel old Every time it's mentioned around me. Oh, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Because, and, and, and I started playing it and I was like, oh, this is dumb. Okay. But it, it's, it's, it's like a simpler version of like Mafia or like uh, Spyfall. Right. It, yeah. It reminds me Where of Where you're lying to your friends and that's the point of the game. Right. And, 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 and it comes down to, all right, let's vote someone out based off of nothing because we don't have any information. We're just going to pick someone that we don't like and, and throw them out. So... Um, this kid's playing Among Us on my phone. Uh, and sometimes I get, and, and, and this kid has been asking for a while. He's like, c- cause he found out a while back, um, that I do some stuff outside of school that I, I've like acted in a few things and, and record some stuff, whatever. And so he, um, sees a notification pop up and it's from the app that we published the, the podcast from. Correct. And. It says the R tenders in the notification, and he's like, "Which I mean is such a great name." Yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, clearly. I mean, we thought about it for how long? I don't even know. We, we too kept long, it, but which I'm proud we've kept yes. it so far. So far. <laughs> um, but this kid sees it, and he is like, "Oh my gosh, Mr. Welch, is this it?" And I was like, "Is what it?" And he was like, "The attenders," and I was like, "No, no." No, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to need my phone back, though. I, I, I forgot. I need my phone back. And so I'm trying so hard to get my phone back. So I'm like, no, 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 no. He starts looking it up. <laughs> After a few different tries, mm. he finds it and starts showing his friends. And so, again, I'm technically in the clear because I did not promote it. I um, He stumbled upon it. You know? I'm not telling you the name of my of my school or anything like that. But he did find it. And my kids have been listening to the podcast and they love it they're they're huge fans and they were like when can we get when can we get danny to come to school and i was like oh my god you know the name you know his name oh no but they were like when when can we get him to come to school he's so funny and i was like uh i don't know you guys that's not i don't know i am i want to say though i'm flattered that uh we have such a reach that it it even you know we touch the hearts of of middle schoolers and and that's our base you know that's our that's our clientele well uh, oh yeah yeah yeah. we clearly made this show for middle schoolers um but but they they 
they start. They all started off with Seven Samurai because it's the first episode p- published, and they're like, w- uh, "What's this?" They're kind of confused by it, and I was like, "No, no, no! Just scroll through and find one that you already know. Then it will make more sense." And they're like, "Oh, okay." And they all had watched Berserk before, so they oh, listened no. to the Berserk episode, and they were like, "Oh, this is cool!" And I was like, "Thank you, thank you." So, yeah. So, so, so I, I, I just wanted to tell you that. There's a possibility that this is being listened to right now at this very moment in in internet time. We we are we are in somebody else's ears is yeah. what you're telling me. Yeah, and and it's a child. It's it's a it's it's a 13-year-old. Speaking of uh 13-year-olds that uh stick their nose in places. That was very rude. I don't know why I went with what? that. <laughs> what kind of segue is that? Okay, go ahead. Just well, go because ahead. I I was thinking I was like, okay, let me use this as a, as a segue. This I'm pulling back the curtain right now. I'm, let me use this as a segue. Thirteen year old. Okay, but they're not like these kids, as far as we know of, are not prodigies. Maybe prodigies in their own right, but you know, I was just trying to find a way, and I and I was flummoxed, and it's very clear. And as I'm just, you know, trying to get out of the hole that I dug myself, why don't we talk about Queen's Gambit? It's flummoxed. You said flummoxed. Failure. Okay, Queen's Gambit. Do, do, do you want me? Do you want me to to, to start the fir- with Damn the first it. thing that I? Do you want me to talk, start with my first uh, talking point? Uh, sure. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the very Absolutely. first thing. Very first thing on my on my list. Is chess hot? That's a great question. To which this show says, hell yeah. I had never... I don't have any sort of experience with chess. Chess has always been this sort of intimidating game where it's just like, that kind of looks like fun, but I don't want to learn. Let me just go over and play some checkers. I thought you were going to say, I have no experience being hot. <laughs> also true. That 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 would have landed a joke much better. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. So yes, I have no, experience with, no experience with chess, no experience with being hot, and no experience with uh, being hot while playing chess, and no experience with chess being hot in my life. So, but as I was watching this show, I'm like, yo, Jess looks like a lot of fun. Like, right. it is intense. Right. And, and and that's just, like, the surface of the show. Yeah. The best way I can describe this show from the get-go, that it definitely feels like an anime or a video game in a similar vein of Lovecraft, Love, <laughs> Lovecraft Country. But in the case of this, there are like bosses throughout yeah. this show. You know That's where, a good way of putting where the it, yeah. main yeah, and where the main character Beth faces off first against Towns, and then she faces off against the 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 best player in Kentucky, and then later on she faces off against uh, the guy from New York. It's it's very much so like anime in structure when it comes to like hitting those tropes. But it is still such a gem to yeah. watch because even though it feels like that on the surface level, with the context of chess, the pacing and the writing and the acting is very, very well done. Yeah, and, and, and it's interesting. Uh, you, you were talking about how it, it feels like a video game. I think it only feels that way because it spends so much time on the game of chess. Right, like it, it, right. it's not like they introduce chess and then keep coming back to it. Whenever they're in the matches, it is kind of story, but it's not about the the story that that that's happening in terms of the relationship between the two people playing. It, it, un, unless it's like speed chess or like one of the times where you're like, oh, they're they're they about to fuck. Um, it's it's almost always you're watching the game because the game of chess is interesting. So, which which leads me to my next huge question is, wh- why, why was this show made in the first place? What was it? Was it meant to be a story? Because at first I was like, oh, it's a, it's like a feminist story. Like that 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 that's what they were going for originally. That that's what the story was made to be. And then mm-hmm. after a while, I was like, I think the person that wrote this just likes chess. I think that it's a. It feels like it feels like a chess movie in the same way that The Natural is a baseball movie. Do you know what I mean? It feels like a sports in, movie. In some ways, yeah. Like, but 
I, I, are you trying to say in both cases that it tells the story through the sport that they're playing, but it's very much so clear that the sport that they are playing is the backdrop of what's going on? A, a, li a little bit. It, I, I'm not saying that it should have been more story, um, but but it is weird because I thought that it was just going to. I thought that it was going to be a. A character trait. I thought that it was going to be, oh, this is Beth Harmon. She's very strong-headed. She is very um, independent. She had a tough childhood, blah, 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 to childhood. And she also plays chess. I didn't mm -hmm. think it was going to be, this is a chess movie about chess for chess players. And every single episode of, like, every single hour-long episode, a good 15 to 20 minutes of it is going to be you watching chess players play chess. And so much of the show... Too. Like, they'll, when, once she gets to chess matches, like, you won't see the whole match. They'll skip around a yeah. lot in the match, and you'll see, like, the key points of the match. Because, I mean, we're talking, like, up to two hours of playing one game of chess, right? right. But so much of the show is preparing for the next match. It's, yeah. it, it's, it uses its storytelling. Um, and incorporates part of its storytelling with part of the, the training that Beth, the main character, has to go through. So, like I said, when she is training, that's when, per se, the story takes place, right? There are still story beats that happen during these games, but you see the story really hit its stride when she's, like, training and when she is... Uh, training with other characters in particular and that's yeah. when you get the pieces of her as a character because I, I think it's I think it's safe to say in in my opinion and uh, and for so much of the show and I think it aids the storytelling in the end not in the middle of it but in the end it pays off that the main character Beth played by Anya Taylor-Joy who does a miraculous job has so many walls right that but you see the construction of each of those walls so like like, like you watch it take place like you watch her make the build the walls yes yeah, so yeah. You, i mean you primarily see her build the walls in like the first couple of episodes right when she's constantly around individuals who have little care about her except for a few right yeah and so you see the construction of the walls so in the middle of the show it's hard to get a sense of like okay so where is this character going yeah um and it's it's clear and it makes sense right it makes sense that her drive is to just play the next chess game and to be the best chess individual and so she's not thinking past that and it's perfectly okay and i think it it works that so much of the show is focused on the next chess match. Um, but in the middle of it, I think the show suffers because she has so many walls. You don't see her... I'm trying to find the words here. But you don't see her struggle. You see her internally struggle. And I feel like the show deserves a second watch. So you can get a better understanding of the internal struggles. But in terms of... Internally, she's struggling, but she never shows it. And yeah. she doesn't show any of those internal struggles until the very last episode. True. When she comes out of the basement of the right. foster home. Right, to Jolene. And, and, but you see little pieces, right? You see her kind of curled up in her ball after uh, her adoptive mother died. You see her, like, shed a few tears uh, at the end of some chess matches. Like, you see moments of it, um, but... But the show isn't about that, right? And right. so I kind of appreciate the show and I kind of critique the show that the show is much more of an adventure as opposed to a character piece. Yes. So w w something you just said is that that's not what the show is about. Now, I I would really, really, really like to dive into... Uh, the next question, but I feel like the next question is so large that we might want to take a look at it um, after a word from our sponsor. Sound good?
whoa, this early on. Yeah, I, I, I th- uh, because the next th- thing is, I think, going to be the meat. I have a feeling it's going to be the meat of the, the, of the, of the pod. As you wish. All right, if you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Now, just let me explain. First of all, it's free. Second of all, Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and a whole bunch more. And third, now this is really important, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Hear me when I say no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. All right, everybody, and welcome back to The Artens with Mac and Dan. Um, so where we left off, what is the show about, right? Because so, I... W- <laughs> Whenever I look, because because th- 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 for me this is the the weak point of the show. Um, I love that the show fe- is is in in terms of structure structured a little more like a movie because it it just it feels like a long movie in that the story never veers. You never get fluff. It cuts. I love the pacing. I love this. The pacing. This is absolutely sublime, sublime, perfect pacing. I love this. But the the weak point for me is. The lovely thing about sports movies, right? Because I'm 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 going to call this a sports movie because I, I that's exactly what it is. It is a in a person. You're so right. It's, it's a. I didn't even think about that. You're so it right. Is, it's a person that that plays a sport. They um, are very good at it. Then they hit a wall. Then they have to train to beat the top person who we're introduced to at the very beginning. And then they eventually overcome that person. But look at the other sports movies. They're all about something else, right? I mean, let's look at Remember the Titans because right. we've already done that one. Um, it's about brotherhood. It's about race. It's about, um, unity. It's about, uh, peace, right? Right. What the hell is this show about? I mean, the, 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 the arc is chess. The arc is chess, right? The arc is, she gets introduced to chess at a, at a hard time in her life. She uses it as a coping me- mechanism, which is fantastic. Cool. She comes to a certain point where she, um, loses uh, and and then she has to train to get better. She trains to get better. She goes to Russia. She beats the bad guy. And then there's nothing else after that. It just ends. Meaning that the climax, the thing that was the pinnacle of the story, was her winning the chess match. So it felt like there was nothing more than that. So what is the story about? One theme that really stuck with me watching this show is the theme of perseverance. Okay. That she okay. was going into a sport that she was able to participate in, but all the same, it was largely just male individuals, um, some of which who were misogynistic, mm-hmm. and a lot of people who were out together. Um, in more ways than one, right? I'm not saying just the chess players that she faced off against who would doubter on almost every turn but also the reporters there was one moment that i thought about a lot because i loved mr scheibel as a character yeah uh and i thought it was a really smart choice and uh it paid off really well that once we said goodbye to mr scheibel like once i should say beth said goodbye to mr scheibel we never saw him again yeah Right, but we still felt his presence be super strong. And so when she, Beth, was speaking to the Times reporter in her bedroom, and she brings up how she learned to play the game of chess uh, from the janitor, Mr. Scheibel, yeah. and how the fact that later on when the story was printed, Mr. Scheibel wasn't even mentioned. Mind you, that reporter was female as well, but it's still in the same sense of like people out together. There's also the the classmate that she had, Margaret, who was out together. When she met Matt and Mike for the first time, uh the twins, they were doubting her heavily heavily, as where well is Harry Beltic, right? Like one of the few people who didn't doubt her from the beginning was Towns, right? So that's a big point of this show. Um, and so I can, I I see both sides of her, of her character being one to constantly have walls up and we don't see those walls come down until the last episode, but 
you see exactly why she has to have those walls up because it's not even just in the context of chess, but it's also in the context of her being raised in a foster home, her, you know, just dealing with the fact that her adoptive father just couldn't care less about her. And then her adopted her adopted mother is more like a child more than her. And then her adopted mother dies and she has to take the brunt of it all and really take care for herself. So that's those are the big things that this sh this show tackles. It's more of a coming of age story. Of course, it's through the lens of sports, right? True. But the big thing that I think this show is about is perseverance and and also just it's, I mean it's a classic tale of if you set your mind to it and if you really want it, you can get it. Sure. And 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 one thing that that's really really nice about um, this, and and I think that it gives a very very cool perspective um, on uh, uh, on on feminist themes. Meaning, like I think it is super super interesting that um, her character doesn't really talk about feminism. Her character really doesn't really talk about what what it's like to be a uh, what it's like to be a woman in in her circumstances and she hardly talks about herself true too. really ever um but but like whenever people talk, like everyone around her always is talking about oh man a woman in chess i wonder what it's like and everything but that that that's never even something that crosses her mind like she never thinks about it until it's directly in front of her and then she's like that's dumb and then she moves on um yeah which 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 is Cool. I, I I like that a lot. Um, and it also makes sense for a character that she's so obsessed with winning that her being this icon, like, even though it hits her at the end, everything just hits her at the end. Actually, the, the very last episode, it's such a good episode. That's a very good episode. Um, it hits her at the end that, oh, wow, okay, so I am important to other people. But at the very beginning, she's like, I I'm just here to play chess. I want to be the best chess player. I don't want to be the best female chess player. I'm not here because I'm a female. I'm here because I want to win chess. Well, you, which is interesting. you said the last episode was 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 really great. Can we agree that, that that was the best episode? I think so because the last episode does a very good combination of payoff and still character building. Sure. Um, you'll yeah. see plenty of episodes for other shows. That'll be like just payoff or just small storytelling for character building. Where I think in this episode, it's a great culmination of all of those things. Um, That's a very small I mean, observation. And it's still right. my favorite scene of her walking back down into the basement of the foster home, and her and she she's looking around, and she gets back into the car with Jolene, who was a friend of hers from the foster home when she was younger, and she just balls her eyes out yeah. and i start crying too because i'm just like oh my god she's human oh Jesus. yeah she finally just like yeah feeling, right and, but feeling it's not that she's human i shouldn't have said that but feeling the no, you're humanity right. of that moment and yeah. feeling like jesus christ like this it really hits you that this poor girl what she had to go through to get here now um yeah the, the, it's powerful and and that's in the last episode and then it does even more than that, because it builds up to that final battle, quote unquote. Right. For, 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 for me, the, the, fi the final battle is, is what hit me emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, but but I, I was going to say, and this is, uh, I, I I don't want to take credit away from the writers, directors, or actors because they they, they really did do a, a fantastic job with the story they were trying to tell. Um, and so I, I I don't mean to because I feel like there's always this, uh, there's always this. I don't know. It feels like kind of a slap in the face whenever someone's like, oh, yeah, that was really just good music. Like, that was really just good music that got me. It wasn't the story. Um, but the music in this show was fantastic. I think that's what made the last episode the best episode, for me at least, is that... Both the soundtrack that they use and the score. Right, right. C Carlos Rafael Rivera gets my gold medal. My gold medal goes to Whoa. homeboy Carlos Rafael Rivera, who, uh, who, 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 who created the music for the entire show, but specifically the last episode was unbelievable um 
Yeah, and I don't think that it was necessarily anything groundbreaking or or different. It was just so so effective. Um, yeah, I, it's it's there are not a lot of times in movies, at least for me in my experience. I'm I will admit, like I'm not the biggest. I don't want to say fan, but I don't I don't care for uh movie scores that yeah, much, okay. right they don't they don't pop to me okay sure but the the score for this show immediately popped and it was this blend of i i always felt like for movie scores if if i just listen to it like it's just a whole lot of nothing in the sense of that movie score that score needs the movie right uh-huh. But as opposed to the score for this, like I think the score is so well done, I could listen to the score by itself and enjoy the score by itself, even if I hadn't seen this show. And I think there's so much character in the score itself. Like I, th- I think that's the best way to describe it, that the score is its own character to yeah. also help the story as opposed to just, you know, putting a button on a moment. Sure, sure. Okay, yeah. Um. So... so- the, the the next big question I have for you, Danny, is this. Why do you think this is the most popular show in America right now? That is that is the – oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just – I'm because I, I wanted to talk about yeah. this too. I wanted there, to ask you this question that, too. That, that, that's, that is the reason that I picked this, right? I, I, was, I was talking to Emma, my girlfriend, for anyone that needs to know, um, about – what we should do for the podcast. And she was like, well, you guys do a lot of like really indie stuff or, or like, like, like nostalgia stuff. Why don't you guys do something that's a little more, you know, current, what, what, so, contemporary, yes, so, something yeah. that, you know, people are watching right now. And I was like, okay. And so I went to Netflix and I saw number one and I was like, this seems fine. And so, um, I wanted to see what, what, what we had to say about the queen's gamut. Why do you think this is the number one show on Netflix? The most popular show in America right now. I am going to give you the worst answer. Oh shit. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> um now mind you, mind it's great, you though. It's great. mind you, exactly. This show is fantastic. Right. But I think us two going into it, knowing that it was the most popular show, we're like, oh, this show must blow us out of the water, right? Yep. But anything with that high of expectations is gonna let down. Is exactly now, mind you, we're in a sort of it feels like we're in a sort of uh, media drought, right? When it comes to television shows, like the only shows that I'm hearing about right now is Queen's Gambit and The Mandalorian. Interesting, right? There's nothing much else, and I guess Shit's Creek probably, um, but but there's nothing much much else that's like happening right now. Um, so. Well, it's always the next big thing, right? It's always the next new thing. You were going to say? Yeah, I, I was going to say, so we have watched two of the top five TV shows of 2020 for this podcast. And maybe you didn't even realize it. But oh, um, would you say that this makes more sense to be the most popular show in America or Lovecraft Country? Because Lovecraft Country is, I think, number one on Amazon right now. I think this show is more popular because... Uh, to put it bluntly, I think more people have Netflix as opposed oh, to Amazon Prime. Sure, that makes sense. I think, it, I think it's just as simple as that. Because so, Netflix um, is just the most popular streaming also, service, and this is what Netflix is pushing. Yeah, and and so, I don't know. There, There's a big fascination with Anya Taylor-Joy, the actress, as well. Right now, if you look at social media, people love her. And, and, and um, do, do you I think, think that contributes a lot? That is because people are watching the show and like Annie Taylor Joy, or do you think that is because that that's that's honestly, yes, sorry. Um, yeah. Or do you think it is because it's like a specific as a specific marketing thing? Like they're doing like people are doing a really good job of pushing her so that people get into the show. I think people just like Annie Taylor Joy, and it's just when you watch this show. Also, um, mind you, like I'll I'll say really fast. Does does this show, quote unquote, deserve to be number one, uh, in this country in the U.S. at least? And like, sure, because there's like nothing else really good that's new that's happening right now that just came out, right? <laughs> so it doesn't have much competition to go up against. But in the context of Anya Taylor Joy, her acting is so 
specific. It is some of the most specific work yeah. that I have seen in terms of, first of all, how she treats other characters, how she um, explores those relationships with other characters, how her body reacts and how vocally she reacts to other people that are in the room. Yeah. As well as her physicality when you see her starting at age I was about to I say think, 13 going up to age probably like 20 21 22 yeah i was i was i was about to make the, the age comment that she does there makes is a lot of specific such, body choices exactly yeah. there it, i mean it's such a great crash course yeah yeah in in terms of the specificity and relationships and the physicality that i mean when you watch this show you can't not talk about how great of a performance she gives i feel like I mean, and we're naturally harping on the show a lot because we both went into it knowing that it was a number one show. So it has to blow us out of the water. And even though the show was fantastic, it didn't necessarily blow us out of the water. Right. But that's not the show's fault. No, no. It, we're just acknowledging that fact of the matter. I, I think I think it might have been the story's fault that it, that it wasn't blowing us out of the water because it it wasn't uh, it wasn't special. It was well done. That was what it was. Um, so, but think about but think about this. Think about this. That during when the pandemic was at its high, and the only thing that was happening at the time, I'm just trying to put context true. on this conversation. The only thing that was happening at the time, really, that was coming out, was the Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance. Oh, and that was amazing. It it was super exciting just to get to something. watch, right? Because yeah. it was exactly it was to get something. It was the only thing that was happening at the time. Yeah. But if we look back at it now again think to ourselves man wasn't this awesome we watch it again we're like okay this is a fine documentary like it's such heavily through the lens of michael jordan that uh the the storytelling isn't necessarily all too truthful to the reality right. of the moment it's very michael jordan heavy with its uh rose tinted glasses sure, sure sure and and i think that's that's what's happening a little bit yeah with this show too, that it's super duper exciting right now, as it should be, um, but because it's getting all this hype, that we're we're both going into it. Okay, where's the hype coming from? Right. And we see we see where it's coming from, but people, um, it's like blowing up a balloon, right? We we see we see the hot air balloon, and we're like, whoa! And then we we go into it, and you're like, oh, okay, okay. I mean, this is really good. Don't get me wrong. Um, but this didn't meet the well, I, I've flown in an airplane honestly right. outlandish expectations that we sure had sure um, and uh, it, it, it it's I mean it's kind of I mean it's the same reason that Tenet is on its like millionth week number one in the box office because it's the only damn thing in the box office and and on it and really fast quick review of Tenet it's okay it, right right and most of the people that I've that, that that I know that have seen it are like it was actually really confusing I I don't really know what happened um. And I'm like, oh, okay, good. And they were like, was it fine? And I was like, yeah, yeah sure. Um, so anyway, um, yes, yeah, and 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 that is such a strange thing. But but the, 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 what, something you were saying earlier reminds me of a conversation that that I've been having with a lot oh, with a lot of people recently. And a lot of people that, that that I know that have been um, in the industry for a while, um, specifically actors. And that is that <laughs> there are quite a few of us. I think you and I fall into this category. Um, that are kind of lucky that uh, that the industry and uh, entertainment is getting more and more fascinated and more wanting interesting looking people than conventionally attractive people. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yes, I know exactly what you mean. And that's uh, and that's something that I think Anya on? Taylor. Yeah. yeah, I think I think that's something that Anya Taylor Joy is a perfect representative of. That she is a she is a transitional piece between the conventional attractive and the interesting looking. She's both, I think. Um, and that that actually plays a lot in, in her favor. Another perfect example is the fact that they can make Thomas Brody Sangster, who plays Benny Watts, into a, a sort of like, I don't know, like like sexually tense character that like you, you might th actually think to yourself like, oh yeah, him and Anya Taylor-Joy, like they might actually get like, you know, like he, he, he he's kind of hot in this one, even though it's like, Ten, ten years ago, he would have been laughed off. That there's no way that doesn't make any sense. But nowadays, it's like, oh well, he's interesting looking. So, 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 so that might make sense because interesting, 
interesting and unique might might be nearly as important as conventionally attractive these days. What was pleasant is that I this is just my theory that I'm just going to throw out there or my sort of hypothesis that there was such a heavier priority in the capabilities of the actor and their work as opposed to just what they look right. like. Right. 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 And it aided the show so much more because we're not going to sit there for, for, I mean, well, we could, but we didn't. Uh, that's just a fact of the matter. Um, sit there for episodes and episodes, take it to ourselves. Man, Thomas Brody Sangster is really skinny. You know, right. We're not, we're not going to think that because the character is really well done. The character itself in its own bubble is well written and the acting's just well done and he gives a great performance throughout the entirety of the piece that's just like whatever yeah. man um but all in all like dude this is this is a great show this is a great show and i i want to get into my sizzle Please. serve super fast i want to say and this maybe is controversial because maybe some people want more Queen's Gambit. But I'm going to say, thank God, there's only one season of Queen's Gambit and that's a miniseries. I agree. I only say that not because I thought any part of this show was bad. I may have some slight uh, uh, qualms with it. But because we see so many shows nowadays where like the first season is clean cut. It's fantastic. It hits all the notes that it needs to hit. And then we get like a season two or a season three or a season four. We see so many shows that overstay its welcome. I think uh, I maybe this is controversial, but uh, I think Stranger Things is a good example of that. I, I would uh, I would have to agree with you. I think the Stranger Things season one is phenomenal. And then they ride off the fact that season one was phenomenal for a while. And they're probably going I to think keep another doing good example is Broadchurch, that even though season oh, two and season yeah. three of Broadchurch is fantastic, it could never beat season one, right? So sometimes stories, we need more time with those characters, right? But the pacing in Queen's Gambit is so neat. It is so refined. It does not waste any of its time. Yeah. Those approximate seven hours that you spend with Beth Harmon and others is exactly what you need to showcase the story and the perseverance that Beth Harmon has to go through. And it aids the show so well, in my opinion. I agree. I, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Um, and, and not not even just the pace uh, in terms of like how many episodes it is, but the pace of the, the episodes themselves. There, there were a few times where I was like, okay, well, it, it, it started to feel a little... Um, a little the master in that th there was there was a lot of like staring at things and like thinking about mm -hmm. the thing instead of doing something. Um, right. But uh, but I mean that comes with the territory of chess. That comes with the territory of making something about chess. Right. Um, yeah. That 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 it's it's such a cerebral game that there's only so many different animation styles you can you can try or cool transitional tools like where you're like oh okay let's have it imagination on the ceiling let's do it where it's like let's do cool chess montages or like show the the announcer person that's like changing around like the giant board that everyone can see you know like tr trying the different ways to make make chess an interesting thing to watch um that eventually you, you just got to show the, the people staring at the board um not only does this show make chess hot, uh, if I didn't say it in the first part, it makes chess look. I mean, it's just cool. Yeah, it's I just yeah. Cool. I I I now want so bad to play chess or just or just figure it out. Um, but also it's a little disheartening because then there's there's also part of me that's just like, I'm never gonna be that good at chess. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, I couldn't possibly scratch. Yeah, that sort I'm of never level gonna be there. Um, that is playing in Soviet Russia, right. beating the number one in the world. Yeah, I'm like, and who cares? 
it's just and having one guy who's been playing chess for decades and decades tell me you're the best player I've ever played against. So, oh, so so oh yeah, what what a payoff! That was such a great moment. Um, oh, seriously. Um, oh, you, oh, something funny that you did is, that you talked about in the master, and I was and I was listening back to that episode and and um, that we did, and I. Uh, and you said something funny that was happening in this series. You talked about, we were talking about transitions. We were talking about going from one place to the next. And you talked about how the master, you commended it for not doing the stereotypical like flash of the location in the year. And that's exactly what this show did. Every, like, every time it happened, I was laughing. Let me, uh, let me clean up the, the, the trail. <laughs> that I, I have I have made, you know, with, with my feet. Sure. Um, with my boots. Um so I commend the master for that distinct choice. I don't blame other shows and movies for having big title cards with the year and with the um with the location. Uh because for this show, I was like, oh, thank God. You know? Right. <laughs> I was like, okay, so this is the year, right? So she's around this age. Like, it, it it helped with the context a lot. But it was also, like, two different things, right? The Master is a story about these two people, right? And their relationship. So does it need those title cards? Not really. This show, The Queen's Gambit, uh, or Queen's Gambit, excuse me. Um, oh, no, The Queen's Gambit. Whew, um, is about, it's... To put it in the most simplest terms, it is this girl on an adventure. Um, of course, it's not as, um, it doesn't look as grandiose as that, considering that it's chess. Um, no disrespect to people who play chess, please do not take it as such. <laughs> but it, it helps tell the story. It, help, it helps showcase the plot line that you are going through. Right, this isn't a character piece. This is a a a plot sort of piece, and 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 that's clear in terms of the characterization that Beth receives throughout, like the middle part of the show. That it isn't necessarily about Beth herself, but it's about the trials that Beth goes through. Right, as opposed to the Master, that that movie is about Freddy and the Master, less about the trials that they particularly go through. Does that make sense in uh, basically to say why this yes. show was better with title cards than without? It? Yes, 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 yes. Um yeah, that that that, that makes total sense. Um and yeah. Yeah, it does. Um Okay. The, well, very good. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I I was I was trying to like uh, I shouldn't No, that's on me. This is this is on me. I want to explain what just happened. So, um I was in the middle of talking. I'm looking at Mac and I see that um from cuz we're over on Zoom and I see the light on his face change. So, I'm like in my head, okay, he's going through like another window. He's looking something up. And then me being an awful teammate, I threw it to him all the same no i i was i was I, I i you know what i'm we're just gonna use that as a as a transition to the next part i was trying to figure out, i i could have very easily just looked it up at any point in time but i didn't look look this up until just now as i was watching queen's gambit there are like three different actors in hollywood that i think played the voice of of ferb and phineas and ferb this is a very weird segue, but keep yeah. going. Every, like, I, every single time that I see the kid from August Rush and the Good Doctor, that kid, you know what I'm talking about? I'm <laughs> yes. like, oh. I don't know his name, but I know exactly who you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Every single time I see that kid, I'm like, oh, that's the kid that voiced Ferb. Every single time that I see that kid from, well, actually, wait, was it the same little bitch um, that was in Nanny McPhee? Was Thomas Brody Sangster in Nanny McPhee? Oh, dude, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell every you. Every single time I, I see I that little... That little kid. I'll, I'll look it up. No, no, no. What no, about, I got what you, about got the you, other kid? You, that, okay. I'm already, well, oh, yes, it is. Okay, good, good, good. So, yes. So Great podcast. Thomas Brody Sangster is British. Is a British actor. And apparently okay. Anya uh, Taylor-Joy, I think, is like Irish or something. Um, but Thomas Brody Sangster is a British actor. And it confused me for a while. Because as I was watching Thomas Brody Sangster, who's uh, Benny Watts, I'm sitting there, I'm like, 
I think that's that bishoply verb. And then I couldn't figure it out, and I was like, wait, no, 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 no. Thomas Brady, no, no, no. The kid that the voice verb was the kid from Nanny McPhee. And only until just now was I like, wait, Thomas Brody Sangster was the kid Nanny McPhee. Like, that's the tracks. So he did voice verb, um, which is weird to think about now because, yeah. Kids grow up. Kids grow up, yeah. Get used to it. Is he younger than us? Uh, I think he is a little bit older than us, oh. uh, as is Anya Taylor-Joy, who, okay, was born in Miami, what? then fluctuated living places between uh, Argentina and England. Then when she was uh, around uh, between like 6 and 14, she moved to New York. Um. And so then started her acting career. So she oh my God. is from a whole bunch of places. So um, we are nothing. Really fast. Yeah, we, I mean, we're, we are nothing. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, as we're wrapping this up really fast, I want to acknowledge the gold medals that I have. Yeah, okay. Um, really fast. It's... To one of them is to Mr. Scheibel, nice. who is played by Bill Camp, who, like I said earlier, that we only see him for one episode and the first few minutes of the second episode, but we feel his presence throughout the rest of the show, and so it ends up being an immense payoff uh, in the final episode when, like, and you can feel it too, yeah. when Beth is, like, missing Mr. Scheibel, yeah, who yeah. gave her that light that she needed so badly. I also want to give it to Marielle Heller, who played Alma, which was Beth's stepmother, simply because uh, at first I was like, this this woman's acting is interesting, but it actually led to me always watching her character really intensely yeah. and always just um, keeping a magnifying glass on her in the sense of what is she going to do next? Like, what what is she trying to do? Like, she she cares about Beth, but it, she also is really narcissistic. Like, what is going on here? So I I commend those two performances immensely because what was nice about this show was that this is a show uh, focused on one character's journey, but the supporting cast around this character was immensely colorful and full of, I don't want to say character, but full of depth. <laughs> and it aided 100%. And um, this show would have been a heck of a lot more boring if it didn't have other interesting characters and actors surrounding it. So I want to say uh, bravo to this show for creating such a piece where even though it's focused on one person there was still a lot of care to the individual surrounding that one person so congrats absolutely um so if, for, for me my wrap up is this um great show uh i i i wouldn't nor and under normal circumstances say that it was the number one most popular show in america but I mean, it makes it makes kind of sense now. Appeals to a lot of people, um, and when you look at the age of this cast, when you look at how talented they are, when you look at their lives, we're nothing. All right, your turn. It's a brilliant show. <laughs> it is. Um, a, and and so once again, does it deserve the um the hype that it's getting? It, but that's not the point. It's that it's getting all this excitement because of the time that it came out right, in. Right. Um. But even taking that aside and just looking at it, uh, you know, through 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 a tube, right? Um, meaning, you know, not having periphery vision towards uh, the surrounding circumstances of the show. It's still a great show, and it's a great watch, and you should absolutely watch it. Because, truth be told, we don't have, first of all, enough stories that are about women as well as uh, sports stories about women. Oh, that's a I can big one. rattle off so many sports movies to you that are not about women. Yeah. Um, and I could tell you two off the top of my head that are about women. And there ought to be more. And so I appreciate 
this show we need to review some being both very very good and and you know approaching this plot line that isn't approached enough yeah um so i absolutely recommend it anything else you want to say mac no i'm i'm going to go what are we going to view this next week it's going to be a little bit different oh gosh okay so it's not viewing no, no, it's not viewing. I, I apologize. Oh, don't, don't apologize. What we'll be uh, playing, I've given this some thought uh-huh. because we did review a video game on this podcast called Oxen Free. Sure. Feel free to <laughs> feel Oxen Free to check out that episode. Also, play that game. It's fantastic. The storytelling, the acting is magnifique. Um, <laughs> but we are Your going big to French. Turn back the clock to like thirty years ago. Oh shit! Okay, where probably more. Nineteen ninety. Probably, uh, probably earlier too. In the eighties, I think when the original version of this came out, where we'll be playing uh, a role-playing game that a lot of other games nowadays still take inspiration from its roots, and it's a classic. And will be, and it's and it's very much so just video game in the most classic sense of the word, right? But I'm nervous. It's available on the App Store if you want to take a look at it. It is the very first Dragon Quest. Dragon Quest. It is a Japanese RPG. Like I said, so many games nowadays owe its sort of tropes and origins. Um, of course, there were some RPGs made before that, but a lot of, like I said, the tropes uh, originate from this game. And so I want to look at both how this aged, and is it still fun? And and I know you don't play video games terribly often, mm. and so how you and I are going to look at it with two different lens. All right, th- thank you. Th- uh, and that, that'll be crazy interesting. Um all right, that's that. That's a thrill. Okay, uh, so in, until next time with Dragon Quest. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you, Danny. Thank you.